dinner. Come back about an hour and a half later. Finally, she's gone. So they think, oh, that's good. Princess is finally left. She's going to make a nest. Isn't that nice? So they unlock the door, go to Gwen, can't get in the door. The door is locked from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Ralph, um, an old man who'd been there for a long time, you know him. Mr. Ralph shines his flashlight in, and sure enough, there's the princess sitting quietly inside. <laughs> Nothing's busted, you know, the door's in one piece, so don't know how they, she got in there, but she's sitting there inside, just waiting calmly. So Mr. Ralph asks her in Indonesia to open the door, and she does. She comes over and unlocks the door. She saunters out, and then everybody goes in to see what happened, and how did this re reverse Houdini thing happen. And they found, as you would expect, she trashed the place. Uh, she opened everybody's bags, ate what she could. I think the really worst that she did was pour some Pepto, some Gatorade into Pepto Bismol, so it wasn't as bad as it could have been. While we were looking to see what had gone on, somebody looked up at the roof, and at the end of the bunkhouse on the second floor, they found the spot where the mosquito nesting was busted, so that was she got, where she got in. That was the same place she went to at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. When she first left people and went up to the peak of the roof, where she got in later in the day was where she stopped. So reconstructing it, what it was is she either saw when she was up there, she either saw something that she wanted or she spotted a weak spot in the, in the mesh, came back and waited people out. And it's well known that great will do that. They will hide and wait for long periods of time until the going is clear to be able to do something. So she came out and hung out with people on the porch for six hours waiting until she knew they were away for a long enough period of time that she could bust in and trash the place uninterrupted. <laughs> so, six hour plan. I think they plan longer than that, but clearly a plan that was laid out, where you get evidence of it about six hours in advance. And not only did she come back from the peak of the room, everybody started talking about how super nice she was when she came back. And that's a clue. When they're being, when they're really going to be bad, they're super nice. <laughs> it's like your kids are too quiet. <laughs> Same with orangutans. And she also, she did not go to the dock for food at 4 o'clock, unheard of. So those are all signs something was up because she did none of her normal stuff. So from about 2.30, from, from the time you could count her as having figured out she was going to do this, a lot of her behavior was abnormal, and it all goes towards laying out a plan to be able to take her house. And she won. <laughs> Actually, that gets me into social intelligence, because despite the fact that orangutans are semi-solitary, when they're around each other, they actually are extraordinarily acute about social things. Uh, I think I took this picture here of Agul. He was an adolescent male tearing apart a coconut. I don't think when I took it, I recognized what was going on in the background. You see another orangutan who's watching Abel. <laughs> this is another adolescent orangutan by the name, or a uh, male by the name of Omega, who was dominant over Abel. And you know what coconuts are like? Uh, fresh ones, you know, the nut that we buy in the store is encased in a, in a fibrous husk. And to get to the nut that's inside, you have to pull off the fibrous husk. It could be a good couple inches thick, five, four or five centimeters thick. And it's really tough, so it takes a lot of strength to pull it off. Well, that's what Abul is doing right now. What Omega is doing is waiting for Abul to do the work, and then he comes and steals it. <laughs> so he waits until Abul has taken all of the husk off, and then he will just walk over and steal them up. And he did. Okay. Um, what orangutans do? What do they pick up when they're watching? You might ask how much they can actually get just from watching, and it's been an issue of big argument in research circles for a long time. Uh, one of the big issues is whether they can learn new behaviors by watching. Can you learn by imitation? Uh, we know lots about aping and parroting, but that's all got a kind of a rote copycat kind of a sense to it. The question here is whether they can learn to do something new and learn some kind of understanding of what they're doing by observing. This is the forest school again that I was talking about. We're back to termite school because young orangutans that are cat ex-captives often don't know anything about termites and don't want to eat them, and they don't know how to get them. So one very enterprising uh, babysitter, her name is Wee the same one that told me the Chechep and Aldrin story, initiated termite school. She'd go into the forest, get some big chunks of termite nests, bring them back to where the orangutans were hanging out, and then you would have a little study group where several of the orangutans that were interested would come in and pay attention to what we, we was doing. We could show them how to make things work. So she'd break the nest and she'd show them the termites. And you can see this is Sirius here. He's very attentive to what's there. And Betty here is working on her own. Betty was really good. The imitation comes along when one day Wewick was working up her uh, termite school 
and she had a piece of a lump of termite nest that she couldn't break with her hands. It was a roundish piece that you just couldn't get any purchase on it. So she walked over to the side of a little river nearby. It's actually, you can see the little stream right here. Took the piece of termite nest, dipped it in the water, rolled it around a couple of times, presumably to soften it, then brought it out, and I guess broke it. I don't remember how she, how, whether it worked or not, but it must have worked. About 10 minutes later, Betty, who's working on her own with a piece of termite nest, I guess must have run into a similar circumstance because she had a big chunk of termite nest and all of a sudden she gets up with her termite nest and she walks the way orangutans do over to the side of the water carrying her termite nest, different place in the water, very carefully placed the termite nest in the same little stream, turned it over very carefully three or four times, took it out and then tried to break it. So she did exactly the same thing that she saw we would do. Now the termite school was very recent so that had never happened before. I actually asked Rubik if she'd ever done it before. It hadn't, so this was an entirely new way of doing things. We are, uh, Benny picked it up right away and used it. Later the same day, you can see you collect a lot of little pieces of termite nest rubble on the ground, and Wewick was again busting them up, I don't know why, but she was using the heel of her boot like this. As Wewick is using the heel of her boot, you look, uh, heel of her boot, you look over to Betty who's sitting on the ground, and with her little heel, she's picking away at the same time. So given the right social context, given the relationships you need and the right kind of behaviors, they imitate very easily and you can very easily see them picking up new ways of doing things from other people. Actually very dangerous because you can't let them see what you do because they figure it out much too fast. <laughs> this is another one that was great uh, that way. This is probably the most complicated I've ever seen. This is Arrangement is making a fire. This is a routine that she copied from watching the cooks in one of the places that I worked. What she did is walk into an outdoor cooking area where the cooks did things like boil water and cook rice. So they had little ground fires. She came in when nobody was there in the middle of the morning because normally they wouldn't let her in. I mean, you don't want to let her in and fool around with fire. But I didn't realize what was going on, and I was probably the most dominant person there, so nobody had the nerve to say no. What she did is she got a couple of burning sticks that were left over from the morning cooking fires, touched them, one to each other, and blew on the junction of them, you can see a little, little heat coming off. Then she went over to this can, took off this thing that was on the top as a lid, and got the little remains of like one of our little water bottles, dipped it into this big can and pulled out some liquid. I thought it was water, so I didn't stop her, it was kerosene. <laughs> so she takes her burning stick and her cup of water, and she plunges the burning stick into the kerosene. Fortunately, it just doused it. She didn't blow everybody out. She then took the stick out, looked at it, put it back in again, looked at it, went and got another hat stick, put it against the first one, blew it, put both of them in the cup of water, still didn't get a fire, eventually picked up the lid and waved it over the, over the, the two ex-burning sticks in the water. She went on for 15 or 20 minutes like this, and all of the things she did were attempts to make a fire that fortunately didn't work. As far as I can see, she didn't fail any worse than I fail when I'm trying to use lighter, fire, fire, uh, lighter fluid on a barbecue. So she had all of the actions right, she just didn't get the subtleties. Again, this is a, a direct copy of what the cooks did. She used exactly the same objects they do, and objects in the cooking area had a fairly short shelf life, so it wasn't as though she had five or ten years to work it out. She used to like to bite the cooks. So cooks didn't let her into the fire making area and you'd be out of your mind to teach a free reigning orang orangutan how to make a fire anyway. So she had to have got this by watching from a distance, even though she didn't get a chance to do this. The only reason she got a chance to do it this day was because I was too stupid to stop her. She still knew the whole routine. Okay. Teaching. That's imitation but a cut, a cut above, at least in terms of showing someone how to do things. It amounts to something like imitating or acting out a routine, but for the benefit of somebody else, or showing somebody else how to do something. This is back to our funny little forest school. They develop really bizarre ideas, and one of the bizarre ideas that's developed in this forest school is that you drink water by dipping stones, and then you take drink water off the stone. It doesn't work very well, as you can imagine. <laughs> Nonetheless, they all drink water off stones. Yeah. Now, here is one of the older for school residents teaching one of the younger ones how to drink water from stone. <laughs> Again, it's a cut above imitation because you're not copying for the purposes of learning something, you're enacting something to show somebody else. So you're almost assuming that they can learn. It's a little less fancy in this case, but the teacher